Welcome to this lecture series in linear algebra. In this lecture, we will strengthen what is known as the first isomorphism theorem. And all we need to know to follow this lecture is the first isomorphism theorem. So let us recall briefly, although we have done it so many times, that we have, suppose, a linear map from a vector space V to W. Then we have an induced map from V mod kernel T to W, such that this diagram commutes. Um, and this is, of course, an injective map purely for set theoretic reasons because this is precisely the set of all the fibers of T. So this is basically the first isomorphism theorem. Uh, what is the isomorphism here? The isomorphism is between V mod kernel T and the image of T. The image of T bar is same as the image of T, and since this is injective, we get a bijective linear map from V mod kernel T to the image of T. All right, and, and as a consequence, we saw the rank nullity theorem. All right, these are the problems. And now let us get started with the material of this lecture. So first let us revisit the set theoretic quotienting. Suppose we have a set X and a map from X into a set Y. The set X is partitioned by fibers of the map. Let's call that map F. All right, uh, I'm not going to recall what is a fiber and all. We have done it. So now suppose, suppose tilde is an equivalence relation or let me know it is a finer equivalence relation. I'll explain what I mean by finer on X. Finer compared to what? Compared to the fiber relation. Well, what is the fiber relation? Basically, two points X and X prime are related by the fiber relation if they have the same image under F. So if you have a finer equivalence relation compared to the fiber relation, uh, it just means that every equivalence class of tilde is contained in some equivalence class of the fiber relation. In other words, if two things are related under tilde, then they are also related under the fiber relation, meaning they have the same image under F. So each equivalence class of tilde is contained in some equivalence class of the fiber relation, meaning it's contained in some fiber, so let's say the equivalence class of equivalence classes of tilde are denoted by these partitions that I'm drawing. Every fiber in turn gets partitioned into several parts, each part being an equivalence class under the tilde relation. So long story short, what we get is we get a map from X mod tilde. X mod tilde is the set of all the equivalence classes. This is set of all the equivalence classes under tilde. So we get a map from X mod tilde to Y, which we will write as F bar. It's somewhat of an abuse of notation, but anyway. And what is this map F bar? F bar, if one thinks about it, will turn out to be nothing but. It takes an equivalence class under tilde to F of X. And one can check that this is well defined. Let me change the color, this is horrible. Yeah. So one just checks that this diagram commutes. You pick some element at x, it goes to f of x, and under the you know this map it goes to its whole equivalence class. And this equivalence class is also sent to f of x, so so it commutes. Uh, basically the point to check here is well definedness. Basically, if this were equal to that for some x and x prime, one needs to check that f of x equals f of x prime. But that's simply because this implies that x is related to x prime under the fiber relation, and hence x and x prime have the same image. In other words, if these two things are equal, it means that they are in the same equivalence class under tilde, and hence they are contained in the same fiber, and hence they have the same image. So this diagram commutes. This is well defined, and hence this diagram commutes. And this is basically what is uh, what I would like to say a strengthening of set theoretic quotienting. In the set theoretic quotienting, we just quotiented out by the fiber relation. Of course, the fiber relation is finer than the fiber relation trivially. Every relation is finer than itself. Just like every, every number is less than or equal to itself in the same way. So if you quotient out by the fiber relation, you get an injective map. The only difference is that this map might not be injective. In fact, it will not be injective as long as tilde is strictly finer, strictly different from the fiber relation. Meaning there is an equivalence class of tilde which is properly contained in some fiber. 
So this may not be injective. All right, so this is something that we keep in mind. And now we apply this in the linear algebraic setting. So suppose we have a linear map from a vector space V to a vector space W. And uh, suppose U is a subspace of V, a subspace such that U is contained in the kernel. Then each, I mean, this is a this is something that one can check. Then each left coset, and each each coset, each I mean, left coset, right coset doesn't mean, doesn't really make any difference in this case. So each coset, or perhaps I didn't even introduce these terminologies, left and right coset. So forget about it. Each coset of U is contained in some coset of kernel t. This is a trivial statement simply because v plus u is contained in v plus kernel t for all v. Why? Simply because u is contained in kernel t and hence v plus u is also contained in v plus kernel t. So each equivalence class under the relation induced by u on the vector space v is contained in the equivalence class induced by kernel of t. Let me recall what I mean by equivalence class induced by a subspace. If u is a subspace of v, then we can define a relation on v by saying v1 tilde v2 if their difference is in u. This is precisely what happens. Uh, this is precisely equivalent to the fact that v1 and v2 are in the same left coset or in the same coset of u. Sorry about keep messing up with the left coset thing. Right, so basically just verify this and by what we just saw in the set theoretic case, we get a map like that purely for set theoretic reasons, which we will also denote by t bar or t tilde, whichever. This is the projection map. This map, of course, just takes little v to the coset in which v lies. And t bar sends v plus u to t v. And this diagram commutes, again, for set theoretic reasons. But the point is that t bar is linear. t bar is linear. And that's a simple check. So I leave it. And this is what I will call the revisitation or whatever, a strengthening of the first isomorphism theorem. This might not be injective. This will be injective if and only if u is equal to the kernel, otherwise it won't be. And uh, further, one can even you know extend this diagram. So one can see that this further factors through v mod kernel t to give this map, which maybe I should just, I, I don't use tilde, let me say double bar, looks ugly, but anyway. So, what is what is the horizontal map? First, let me redraw this. V plus U goes to TV. And what is this map? This map is very simple. It takes V plus U to V plus kernel T. And of course, this map is V plus kernel T going to TV. So this whole diagram commutes, meaning whichever starting point you take and whichever traffic you take, following the arrows, one has to respect the direction of the arrows one does not see any conflict. So this diagram commutes and uh, basically there is an intermediate, there's an intermediate diagram between the diagram that we get in the first isomorphism theorem. This is the diagram precisely that we get for the first isomorphism theorem. This is nothing but the composite of these two things and once you see this is the natural projection map from V to V plus kernel T. Uh, all we have done is we have an intermediate uh, factoring which modulates what is happening from here to here. So this is a simple comment, but a useful one. All right. And this has an application, uh, which is useful in inductive reasonings uh, in order to prove linear algebraic facts. So let me introduce the notion of an invariant subspace. Suppose we have a linear endomorphism, V and you know the domain and the target of T are the same. So it's a linear endomorphism of V. A subspace U of V is called an invariant subspace of T or a T invariant subspace. It could be referred to as in various ways, but I hope I will stick to these two terminologies, mostly this terminology, T invariant subspace, if T of U is contained in U. We do not insist that T of U is equal to U. We just insist that the image of U under T is contained in U. So then what happens? We can do the following. We have a map from V to V, namely the map T. Here we will compose it by the natural projection onto the quotient by u, and we get this composed map. 
Now this composed map is nothing but pi composed with t. Note that every element of u is getting killed by this map. Getting killed meaning is in the kernel of this map. Why? Because you pick little u in capital U, it goes into capital U. That's what this means. So any little u goes into capital U, and under the natural projection, of course, it goes to zero. Any element of, uh, I mean, th this this any element of capital U goes to zero under the natural projection, right? So again, you start with an element of capital U. It goes inside U. It's an element of capital U. And hence, it goes to zero under pi, and therefore, this guy kills that guy. And hence, since u is contained, since, let me write that here, since u is contained in the kernel of pi composed with t, we get, we can apply what we learn, just learned, we get this factoring, v mod u to that. And uh, this should be written as pi composed with t bar, but let us figure out what this map is exactly. So we start with, let's say, a vector, let me erase this. So we start with a vector, let's say, x. We go to t of x. Then we go to t x plus u. And in this direction, we get x plus u, which goes to that because the diagram commutes. So this map is a very simple map. It just takes, it just takes v plus u to tv plus u. I used an x here, but I use a v here, so forgive me for that. In other words, we can also write it succinctly as v bar going to t of v bar, where one has to understand the meaning of bar. v bar simply means the coset of u in which v lies, which is that. So this is very useful because using this linear map, we have passed to a linear map of a vector space of smaller dimension. And uh, sometimes, or in fact many times, it happens that by induction, since this has lower dimension, we can inductively assume some property that we wanted to prove for this guy and somehow we can you know pull that property up by some intelligent reasoning so this is very useful in inductive arguments right so just remember this this little fact there's not much to remember anyway all of this works out on its own, on its own so i guess this is all that i wanted to say in this lecture as usual like comment share subscribe i also have patreon the link is in the description below thank you for listening and i'll see you next time